Well, hold on, got it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kimberly Hartke, and this is the Books on My Nightstand, my, my podcast that interviews wonderful authors of self-help, help, motivational, and inspirational books. Today, I'm with Lisa Rigoni, and this is her wonderful new book, 17 Spatulas and the Man Who Fried an Egg. Intriguing title, I must say. <laughs> you, you can't imagine the gems in, in this book. Um, Lisa, welcome to my show. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm so excited to be on this. I know it's taken us a while to get here. So yes, I'm, excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be interviewing you. And I've been ta talking about it to people all day. You kept coming up in conversation. Oh. The, the book, you guys, is by an organizing expert. However, it's not really about organizing. It's about the fundamental causes hmm. of the clutter bug syndrome, which I have in spades. Yeah. And yeah. I realized that Lisa was really onto something and the book, she weaves together a bunch of stories of different cases. She's worked with different clients she's worked with and what she learned from the process of working with these clients. So it's a really interesting book to read. And Thank I you. want to start Lisa with um, your background, because you start in the book with your childhood and the impact that that had on you mm -hmm. and why you're now an organizer. You didn't start out as an organizer. We'll go into that with the next question, but <laughs> tell us about your childhood and the, what, uh, you know, what happened there and why you think sure. it led to this career. Well, um, so yeah, so I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago with three brothers, two older and one younger in an Italian Polish Polish American uh, household. And there was just always chaos. There was just, all, there was something going on. My brothers were doing this. We were all athletes. We were all dancers. We were all running around doing whatever. And then <laughs> we were the, the house on the block that everyone hung out with. Like all 20 kids in the neighborhood were just always at our house, always in the front lawn, the backyard at the pool, you know, in our pool, little up, you know, above ground pool. And it was just the place to be. Like you always knew where your friends were. They were always at our house, which was great. Uh, but it was also overwhelming for me. And I didn't know why until years later that uh, when things got too much for me, I would, I didn't know how to react. I, I got very frustrated and angry and um, didn't know, didn't know what was going on. I couldn't function. I really, I mean, when I go back and think about it, it's like, man, I was, I wasn't necessarily a brat uh, per se, because in school, everyone, oh, she is always smiling. She's always happy. She's, you know, things were good at school. I think, you know, I didn't feel like um, I was overwhelmed, but when things were overwhelmed at home, too many kids or, you know, I had brothers, they all smell like there's just a certain boy <laughs> energy and smell. And then even when my girls' friends were over, it was always yelling and screaming and sometimes it was just too much. Um, and then I, I even say in the book, like then you add in sugar and, you know, not sleeping or running or, you know, all of the tang, right? Remember in tang in the seventies and it was just too much for me. So I would go in my mom's, the hall closet and organize her towels, or I would organize my pets or my books, or I would go and like smash my pillow, punch my pillow, like anything just to get that energy out. But thinking back, what, 40, 50 years now, uh, organizing was something that I used to calm myself mm -hmm. because it puts structure and, and uh, clarity, cleanliness to the chaos that I was feeling. And again, I, I worked with a lot of therapists. I worked personally with a lot of therapists to kind of figure these things out for myself. And it's something I could control because I couldn't control my surroundings. So I can control what I was producing, I guess, or, you know, the finished product. So years later, now I use it, you know, for my clients and help them, I, I say, create calm within their chaos. And it's, 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 you know, a lot of people don't have that skill. They don't know what to do. So that's kind of, you know, how I teach it when my clients need it, you know, because yes. they think overwhel it's overwhelming to organize. It doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. you know, if you think of it, you think of the outcome. Well, that what you described, that overwhelmed feeling, I used to call going on tilt. Oh, <laughs> 
Anyway, yeah, I, I think that's such an interesting story. And of course, that's the way the book starts out with her personal uh, background. And you didn't start out, though, thinking you were going to be an organizer. Tell us about your earlier career, <laughs> what, what you came out thinking you were going to be doing. Yes, that. yes. I've had, I've had this is really my third career. Um, I ser I do think I was put on this earth to help people and to um, give people the permission to let go mm -hmm. physically, mentally, all that. So I started out as a performer. My two brothers danced on Broadway. We were all performers, dancer, singer, actress. I did Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I did. I went to performing arts high school in Chicago. I went to a conservatory for college and I was going to be a Broadway star. I was wow. going to be a movie star and that was it. And, you know, because my goal when I was younger and so I stopped dancing when I was about 25, but I started when, I mean, I think I was five or six years old when I started dance and I was a professional, wow. I think when I, about when I was 13 or so. And my goal there was for people just forget their problems for a while and just sit in a show and just fantasize and watch the dancers or the actresses or, or whatever, and just forget about stuff for a while. And then I transitioned into a personal trainer and I had a fitness business in Chicago. I had about seven or eight uh, fitness instructors teaching seniors and personal training. And I taught at a bunch of clubs downtown. And there, my goal was also to help people uh, get in shape and get physically comfortable with themselves and, you know, where to start. Uh, and I, I found when I moved here to Virginia, when I started, I was still doing personal training and some fitness classes. And then really uh, organizing just kind of came out of the blue with play dates with my girlfriends who would say, my garage is such a mess or the basement or the kitchen. And I, I'd say, Hey, let's organize. Let's, let's do something about it. And most of them, I said this in the book, they're like, no, you don't want to do that. That's hard. That's horrible. I don't even want to do that. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. It's, it was fun. And, and they, they found instant relief. Like you just do a little bit of organizing or decluttering or, you know, getting things out. You don't want, you feel lighter. Mm -hmm. So when I thought back in my previous careers, especially fitness, they were very similar. And my clients are very similar. Mm. They don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> we collect stuff. We collect weight. We don't really want weight. We don't really want stuff, but it's kind of a protection. And it's a way to feel safe, even though not technically it's not safe, but people don't want to be seen. They don't want, they don't know where to start. And so clients are pretty much the same in the same headspace of please just help me just give me a starting what what can I do right now uh organizing is a l instant relief you know really you can see a difference fitness and health and losing weight or getting in shape takes a little bit more time so I really yeah. love the instant gratification that organizing can bring you right well tell mm -hmm. us about your little system Okay, the little system. So I started my business 15 years ago in 2008-ish. And the name of my company used to be Leave It to Lisa. And going back to my childhood, that's what my brothers used to say when they wanted me to do stuff. They'd say, oh, leave it to Lisa. She'll take care of it. She'll get it done. She'll make the decisions. And that was a good thing and a not so good thing when it came to, you know, making all the decisions, not all the decisions, but a lot of them. And when I started my business, I said, I just want my clients to let, let me take care of it. Let me help them, you know, leave it to Lisa. She, you know, I have resources, I have referrals. I have people that, that I know that can help you and I can help you. Let's see what you need. And so when I started teaching and hiring people, I had to figure out what, what, how do I, what do I do? How do I do this? I, you know, I was good at it. It just came naturally to me, but how do I recreate it? And the acronym leave it to Lisa is little L I T L. So I created the little system and it's, I work with a lot of therapists, like I said, and I've tried this in many, and actually there's a lot of examples in the book, how the first two steps in the little system are the steps you we make to make every decision in our life. The first step is let it go. So what are the things, if you're organizing, what are the things in your space that you know you don't want? You instantly know you don't want it. And- Gosh. <laughs> 
Pardon? The paper trash. Oh, paper. Paper is hard. It sure is. But you have to go through it, right? You have to think, well, do I want it? Do I need it? Something like that. And that's intentional. That's the I. That's the second step. Intentional is, do I need to keep this? Is this important? You know, or grandma's china. Should What should I do with that? I feel bad that I don't want it. Or I paid a lot of money for this dress and I never wore it. Or, you know, so intentional is you have to think about things. You have to ask those questions. And I think I know that's mostly what the book is about, is, is asking, it's not a how-to book on organizing, it's a how to ask the right questions about why you're holding on to something. And once you know, mm -hmm. then you can decide. But most people don't know why they have things in their house that have just been there for years. So those are the first two steps. And then the second two steps are really, it's the outcome of making those first two steps. And the T is transform. So you've transformed your space. You've transformed how you feel about things. You know why you're keeping things. So you're transformed. Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time. A lot of people, I want everything. I'm, how am I going to choose? So, you know, they give themselves a little pat on the back because, oh, I, ha I can make these decisions. You know, it's a little boost of confidence for them, for me, me too. You know, anything in the book, everything in the book, you know, is parallel in my life. So I can help my clients with it somehow, you know, be empathetic with their needs and their, you know, wants and also their struggles, you know? Um, and then the L is love it and live it. So you love your space, you're living in it a little bit better. And if you're moving, you know, you're loving what you've kept for the most part, of course. Yeah. So that's the little system. Excellent. Uh, well, I love how you came up with that using the name of your first company. Yes, yes. Um, now, the book, you've mentioned therapists several times. The yeah. book focuses on the mental underpinnings of a clutter issue. Mm -hmm. So did you come to discover this because you found they were a good referral partner, the psychotherapist in your community? Is that how you realize that it's really part of mental health? I think so. I think so. I was with a group of um, that I spoke at a long time ago, and we did some. We I have to start doing this again because it was very cathartic and healing for the clients. They brought something in. I'll just use my AirPod, you know, case. Um, they brought something in that they either loved or had a struggle with. So I called it a show and tell. And because I found working with my clients, they would have something and go through so many emotions when they held it or looked at it. And then there was this freeness at the end going, oh, now I know. Because most people don't think, well, it's just sitting on my shelf for years. I don't know. Uh, so we did this with a group of um, a therapist group that she had come in like once a month. So I came in and they, the therapists were blown away. And so were the people at how much healing went, went through it. And the emotions that came through just holding on to something and talking about something. Cause I find that, and I share that with, a, with some of the stories in the book, which is, you know, you don't realize it, how emotional you can get or, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't even like that. I don't even know who gave that to me. You know, so it's kind of one of those, I had one person that got gift from somebody and she's like, but it's so horrible. I don't remember who gave it to me, but isn't it bad to get rid of a gift? Well, not really. If you don't want it and you don't remember who gave it to you, you know, so we all have these myths about ourselves, which is another chapter I talk about that we're a bad person because we don't want something someone gave us. You know, would you want someone to keep what you gave them if they didn't want it? I wouldn't, you know, it's, yeah. So it's, I, so to answer your question, I don't know chicken before the, I don't, I don't know if I just realized I had a couple clients, a lot of clients about three years in say, start telling me that it was, they were, I was helping them with more of just the physical clutter. Like it was the mental clutter, which I call, you know, just stuff we don't not even aware of, or because you can't focus because your space is so crowded and so cluttered. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of mental clutter, emotional clutter. It, it but really, at that, you know, 
it affects me that way. If I, when my space gets really out of control, yeah. it's kind of like a weight on my brain. And me too, exactly. When I take the time to jettison the papers that don't belong or the trash, the circulars mm -hmm. that came in the mail that I never even looked at, I feel a lift, an uplift and exactly. it's a mental uplift. It's it really is. amazing. It is. It's because it's procrastination when you don't do it. Yeah. You know, it's delayed. There's so many layers, so many different ways of procrastinating. Like I had a pre uh, uh, presentation yesterday that I knew about two months ago and I procrastinated and procrastinated. But my procrastination, I was already always thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you know, two days ago, I was able to go, oh, this is what I want now that I've sorted it out in my head. So some people do that. And I used to think, oh, you know, I'm so lazy. I'm, I'm waiting to the last minute. But for me, my brain was always working on the presentation, mm -hmm. how I wanted it to, to go. And then it just flew right out of me. The procrastination, clutter, they, there's this whole phrase, I, I, I'm going to get it wrong, but it's clutter is just procrastination of mm -hmm. making decisions. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to think about it now because I don't know what's in there. I'm just going to, I always joke about this. I'm going to have a glass of wine and watch some Netflix. You know, I'd rather do that and not think about having to make decisions, you know, yeah. but then if you don't make them, someone else is going to, or like you said, then it gets too overwhelming mm -hmm. um, and then you don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's typically what happens to me. And I, me too. And I have to put everything else on hold, mm -hmm. deal with it and get, get my life back on track. And then you're right on track. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I know there's a lot of different emotional underpinnings to clutter, but I loved the story of Vince and how you wove it through the whole book. Thank you. And how he was sort of the, um, yeah. I guess, prime example. Now he had a real radical trauma yeah. that caused his clutter and actually hoarding, mm -hmm. say hoarding. Exactly. So um, would you like to get into that or do you want to just uh, in a nutshell talk about why you used one of your clients as sort of the thread throughout? I don't know if you, we, we want to give away the book too much. But... <laughs> well, yeah, I, I can. A lot of people ask about the title. Like even one of the questions of the presentation I did yesterday was, how'd you get the title? Like, it's very bizarre. And even my friends, you know, well, Lisa, you don't cook. So spatulas, man of fried and like, what's it all about? It's not a cookbook. No, it's not. And that's why the back of the book says, guess what? It's not a cookbook. <laughs> it kind of looks like a cookbook when you, you know, look at just the title. Yes. But it's not. Right. And the old spatula that actually is one of my marketing director's aunt spatula. Uh, I don't know what to do for the for the cover. Does anyone have any old spatulas? And she took a picture of that. And I said, that's the cover right there. <laughs> it represents what Alice, the first client, the first character who had the 17 spatulas, she kept the spatulas out of all 17, the one that felt good in her hand, the one she used. And her love was feeding her kids and now her grandkids and that's what she did that's how she shared her love was cooking mm -hmm. and she had a she had a reason for each spatula in her kitchen and the ones she got rid of were the ones that were new and that her family wanted her to replace the old worn out ones so the <laughs> message there was keep the things that mean something to you no matter what they look like to other people right. so we do that with all of our clients like we don't care what you keep we don't care what you get rid of as long as it, you know, it's important to you. Right. And yeah. And so the, and then the man who fried an egg is a gentleman I worked with for eight months. And he found me as a request through his therapist, like a year before she said, and I never knew her. She found me somewhere or no, he found me. That's right. That's what it was. And, but we got in touch because we were doing little mini therapy sessions, just checking in with her, with my client. And he procrastinated, did a little research on organizers and then called me and we just clicked some way. He said, you know, in the book, he said, you didn't, you asked me about me, not about my stuff. And that's important because I, I have a phrase, you know, you're not your stuff. You are not your stuff. It's just stuff. It, it's like, you're not, you, you are what you eat. You're not your stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, it's just, this is a, a byproduct. This is something totally unrelated. I mean, yes, there's a little mental clutter and why you're holding on to things, but you're not your stuff. And when he hired me, I walked in and I said, 
oh, I, there's no way I can help this man. There's no way. I mean, I was overwhelmed and I had to step back and put my feelings aside or my insecurities, not even my feelings, my insecurities on, I, there's not, I can't do anything for this man and just generate all the love I could. And he reached out to me. How can I possibly help him? And if he chooses to work with me, you know, then, then we'll do, we'll get, we'll do something. And so for eight months, about three, four hours a week or more, give or take here, a week here, um, we worked together and couldn't use his upstairs because he had a lot of trauma happen in the, you know, three floor condo, slept on yoga mats in the basement where his little office was and his TV and all of his stuff. Couldn't use his kitchen, uh, microwaved and, you know, basically bought, bought processed food and, uh, after seven months of working with him, we, we, we therapy, I call it therapizing. We therapized each other and helped each other. And kind of, he became like a big brother to me. We just got really close. And seven months in, he called me and he said, Lisa, I just want you to know, I fried an egg in my kitchen for the first time in eight years. Oh. So it was, it's not really giving it away because you have to read the story, but it that's, kind of gives me chills just hearing. I, I know. I when I talk about it, yeah. Milestone for him. It's such a breakthrough Change. in the fact that you helped him get there. Right. That's it that's unusual for somebody to work with you for eight months. It yes. is. It is. He that's had a, a lot, big, and and yeah. he was done. There was probably still more we could do. And I've talked to him since, and he said, "Well, you know, maybe I bought a couple too many books, but it's never going to get back to where it was." because he went through so much healing and figuring out why he was holding on to this stuff and why he was mm -hmm. cocooning himself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's, that's the blessing. That's the blessing he gave himself to just say, okay, what do I want? What do I need? What am I holding on to? That's not serving me anymore. Mm -hmm. All the hurt feelings and all the stuff that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. mm. Excellent. Um, what is your advice on how to choose an organizer? Connect with the person. Uh, make sure it's financially worth it for you. Mm -hmm. um, because I've had people call and say, well, I can get someone for, you know, down the block for $10 an hour, $15 an hour. And, you know, I say in all honesty and all love, use that person. Use that person if you trust them, because I've heard of people walking away with things or selling things. And it's not an organ. I mean, that's probably not a professional organizer, but there are, you know, there are people in professions that are in any profession mm -hmm. that aren't, you know, morally and, you know, <laughs> you don't want to hire them. So, to, you know, so, but connect, make sure you connect with that person and that it's, it's financially feasible because my organizers are $90 an hour. We work very deeply with people. We don't just move your stuff around. We, you know, none of us, well, one of us is a therapist who works for me, Sarah, Sally. Um, but we do a lot more. So when someone says I can hire somebody for $30 an hour, then hire that person. Mm -hmm. Because if that's your budget, that's your, but that's what I started out with, you know, and it has to work for you. It has to be win-win because there's nothing I can do, nothing my organizers can do for our rate if you're set on that $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. So it has to work for you. And also do your background. Uh, I have people that call me and say, can you give me a couple referrals from past clients? Of course. Of yes, course. That's a great idea. Yeah. It's a great yeah, idea. Definitely. And we're NASM. We're certified through the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. I had to record over 40 moves that I've done with people, amount of money, name, last name, or first name, I think it was, first name, how many hours, what we did for that person. So they know we're legitimate. We're a business, you know, we're a business and we're there to help the client. Um, well, now, what does the future hold for Lisa now that you're an author? Do you, do you have big plans with this book? What would you like to see happen? I would love, I would love it to get bigger than my area, you know, Virginia, because the response I'm getting has been just like your response, you know, healing, 
I'm not alone, which was one of the goals of the book was for people to know. I mean, I've been doing this 15 years. I probably worked with a not a thousand, that's a lot of people, but let's say 200 a year, 200 people. Mm -hmm. And probably, especially in the last five, seven years. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of people. And what I found this common theme of our struggle of holding on and letting go. And because of guilt and because of regret, lost dreams, like my, like my, I was going to be a Broadway star, right? How it was very difficult for me to give that up because that was my dream. And I worked and spent so much money on building my, my body and my voice and acting. And how do you give that up? And I find a lot of the things we go through with people, and especially the older, my older clients, couple, you know, they have macular degeneration or they have arthritis, but they're still going to sew and they're still going to do this because this is a dream and they want to keep those things, you know, mm -hmm. those, those, those dreams. And so I lost, I mean, I, I realized this pattern of lost dreams and regret and guilt and shame around things you didn't want. And there's people all over the world, I'm sure that feel this way. Mm -hmm. And I would love to use the book to, for people to use as a resource for them. It's not a self, it's not a self-help book. It's not a how-to organizing book. It's really a, a book to help you ask the questions while you're holding on to something, okay. you know, acknowledgement, like they say in like Alcoholics Anonymous or anything like that, or even just awareness. Yeah. Acknowledging is the first step, you know, oh. and I want to share a story that happened this weekend on Mother's Day. I took okay. my mom out to her favorite restaurant and nice. my mom is, is um, she's not happy about being old mm. and she's kind of grumpy yeah. and it was not a very pleasant meal because mm. she was just, you know, critical of everything. Mm. And we went shopping right after together we went to Marshall's one of our favorite things yes to do. yes my mom and I had the same love yep yep and I noticed though that I was shopping up a storm I filled that cart so fast mm. and I bought two bags of stuff to take home okay because I handled her criticism and her grumpiness pretty well with good humor and such mm -hmm. I wasn't going to let her attitude infect infect me but I believe that my response was to go out and spend, yeah. to medicate my sure. emotions. And I realized yep. this is a big challenge for a lot of people. It's not just getting the rid of stuff, but it's bringing the mm -hmm. stuff in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and continuing to bring stuff in, even when you don't need another blue shirt or you don't right. need another pair of linen slacks or whatever. Now I'm going to mm -hmm. wear these things and enjoy them. Uh, but I noticed my response mm. to the criticism and the behavior yes. that was a little bit, um, you know, it was not happy making when you're trying to do something nice for somebody and right. they, can't, they can't appreciate it. Or right. whatever. So. No, uh, that's retail therapy. Yes. Retail it's therapy. Retail and therapy. It's, yep. I bet, I bet a lot of people it's, it's stopping that kind of activity to keep their house sane. Yeah. Yeah, I'm chaotic. And you have to realize, because I did the same thing. Right? There's a story in my book that my got I got this from my mom. Like she, we went shopping. We went JCPenney outlet. That's, we had no money, but we had some place to shop, you know, even dollar store people can overspend, right? Doesn't matter your, right. your financial um, background or anything. Um, That's how you end up with 17 spatulas. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Or 17, you know, batteries in your garage that you don't know what to do with, or they always have, they have a reason people like batteries and light bulbs, you know, and, you know, things, well, I don't know, we might need it. We might need it. And the someday syndrome comes in. Right. But retail therapy is huge and uh, alcohol, you know, we want to go out and eat and we want to drink to soothe ourselves, right? We buy things to soothe ourselves, to feel, I did this, the talk I did yesterday, a part of it was how much, I'm I, in other parts of the countries, of course, cause I've, I've been all over, that we want to feel as good. We see other people having so much stuff, right? And they must be happy because they have stuff. So I'm not very happy right now. I'm gonna go buy stuff because that, 
is going to make me happy. And it does for a while. Mm-hmm. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. And I've done it for years. I either eat too much, drink too much, you know, or just want to not do, just want to numb or you go shopping. What do I need? What, you know, and here's, here's the, the key to that is, did you get everything on the sale rack? Because usually people who do the retail therapy, they're like, I don't really need anything. But if I find something on the sale rack, that's even like a bigger bonus, you know? Yes. I got um, a few red tag items. That's the clearance <laughs> rack. See? Yeah. See, you're just, everybody is the same. Yeah. I mean, we all do that in one way or another and it soothes us. It makes us feel good for a while. And, you know, even if you, you have the money or you don't have the money, if you get something on sale or if you just buy something that makes you feel good, it makes you feel good for a while. So it, it eases that stress that you felt in the not so ideal conversation with your mom. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. I know it. <laughs> Lisa, how can yeah. people find you and find the book? We can find the book on Amazon. You can also link to on it on my website, which is theorganizingmentors.com slash book. You can buy it right. I mean, it'll take you through Amazon. And uh, and I've been doing presentations all over the place. And I'll be at Barnes and Noble and a couple different places around Northern Virginia, just you know, doing book events, talking about them like this. I don't necessarily do book readings because the book is, I don't know if it's good to read, you know, um, I have ADD, which you find out in the book. So I lose my train of thought when someone's reading something to me or doing a presentation. So I'd rather have this kind of conversation with whoever comes to the groups, to the, you know, to the events and just discuss and people are like, oh my God, that's me. Wait, is that me? That's you're talking about me or I can relate. And that's what I want. That's what I want from the book. You know, just people to say, oh, Okay. I can, okay, there's other people that think this way. Like, remember me, little Lisa, thinking she was the only one who felt, I, I don't know, I'm not in control. You know, um, there's a lot of people out there that felt and feel the same way I do. And a lot mm-hmm. of, like you and me, we just had a, you know, similar thing about the shopping thing. Everybody, had, everybody, almost, uh, you'd say, let's say 99% of people can relate. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. You just called yourself Little Lisa. Now yes. it's Little System to help oh. these people with their stuff and with their mental health. Yes, exactly. <laughs> just a little, right? Yeah, Little Lisa oh. grew up to Little Lisa. Big Lisa with a little system. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that, Kimberly. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. You are welcome. I know you're off to a speaking engagement this afternoon. Yes. Bon voyage. Have a oh, great day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Okay, so I'm just going to stop the recording.